So I'm here to talk about tech debt and platform engineering. One phrase you've probably heard a ton and one phrase you're like, what is Twitter talking about? So to start, my name is Jess Mink. I'm the Senior Director of Platform Engineering at Honeycomb. So hopefully I know what platform engineering is. It's a developing term, so. Uh, the thing I really wanna talk about today is this conference is all about emerging tech, right? All the different pieces of technology and what they're capable of. But tech also changes culture. As we have different tools, our businesses can work in different ways. We're able to solve different types of problems. And so this talk is really about the emerging culture due to the emerging tech and how you can leverage that tech to change your culture in subtle ways. It's always a continuum, right? It's not like one piece of tech comes out and totally changes everything about how you do everything. So some of this will sound new, some of it might not sound new, but that's the nature of something like culture that evolves maybe a little smoother than tech. Okay, so how many of you, show of hands, have ever said, this is really important technical debt, I really want it to be prioritized, and your PM's like, nah, I don't think so. Yeah, so this talk is about how to get those projects on the roadmap and have your PM behind you. So, if you you'll walk away with nothing else, hopefully you'll walk away with how to do that. So here's, the, here's what we're gonna go through. You don't need to read it. It's just for people who like outlines. Okay, so to start with, what the heck is this buzzword, this platform engineering buzzword? Like, it's in the title of the talk, it's all over Twitter. What are people talking about? Um, so this is the mission, of the, the mission statement of my domain. Really, what it boils down to is this is the group that's responsible for making the rest of engineering able to do their jobs efficiently, stably, without having to know all the deep details of Lambda and which instance type is gonna have the best deals and what CI CD tool should we be using, right? This is providing the right abstraction layers so the rest of your devs can get their jobs done. Uh, this is not a new message, right? We've been talking about building the right abstractions for development teams for a while now. Talk about SREs, talk about DevOps, right? Like, this is not new. Um, this is a continuation. Uh, and the reason it deserves a new name is because we have better tools. We have build, better building blocks that we're working with, right? We're not racking servers anymore. We're not installing OSs from scratch, right? Like, there are people doing these things. There are still people doing ops work, and it is super important, right? No shade, it's just, it's been centralized. There's whole companies who specialize in this types of stuff. So that your company that's building virtual paper clips, whatever you're doing, doesn't have to worry about this because this is not differentiating, right? Um, you're probably not even writing as many chef recipes anymore, right? Like, this technology keeps moving. And the, the dirty truth is, this group is probably not writing that much code, right? You're, you're writing code when there's not a tool out there. You're writing code to like glue things together. But like, you're not writing whole systems. If you're writing whole systems that are differentiating, like they might be in the platform org, but they're really part of your product, right? So if you're building whole systems, you're probably like Google or Facebook or someone who has so much budget that the off-the-shelf the off the tools just don't make any sense and those little bits of efficiency you can get by making it for yourself actually matter. Uh, so what are you doing if you're not doing any of that stuff anymore, right? Like we just went through like all the stuff this group used to do. It's like, nah, nah, we outsourced that. Oops. Um, so there's this group with all this budget and all this time, because you probably don't have a product manager breathing down your neck, this is a really powerful place to be, right? Like, you have this superpower of access to all of engineering, tons of budget, lots of time. Like, what are you going to do with all your power? <laughs> what, are, what are the quests that it makes sense to take on, right? And if you read through these, really the theme is that you're trying to make all of engineering better. You're trying to provide those abstractions 
so that people don't have to get into the details. You're trying to make your individual engineering teams more efficient. You're trying to let them move faster and just think about, think about the infrastructure a little bit less. Um, and some of that stuff might be making their debugging loops faster, right? It might be observability and monitoring. It might be your CI CD pipeline, right? It might be bringing in vendors to help with your incident review process, right? There's a huge space, and it's really a fun space because there's some stuff you have to do, and then there's a lot of stuff that you can choose to do. You can figure out what's going to be the highest leverage for your particular company. What are the specific vendors? Where are the specific places it makes sense to really invest that's going to have the most impact for your company? <sighs> yeah, because if you're doing this right, your platform org should level up all of engineering, right? It shouldn't just be enabling. It should really be allowing everyone to be going faster um, and work in a way that really lets them focus on the business value that's unique to your company. Okay, so I just said a lot about platform engineering. But this talk was about tech debt. How do those connect? So one of the things that your platform org is doing, right, is gonna be pitching projects for all of engineering that'll make all of engineering more effective. And a lot of those might look like systematic architectural issues, right? It might look like helping your company scale. It might look like debugging the weird stuff that's at the cross section of like five different teams and there's unclear ownership, right? Like, so, and figuring out plans around that. But as you remember earlier, we said you're not writing a ton of code. So how are you doing this? How are you, like making all of engineering better if you don't actually have rights to that particular code. You're doing it through organizational influence. So we're gonna talk about how to get stuff on the roadmap. And the first example I'm gonna go through is gonna assume you're on a dev team. Because probably most of you are in a pro on a product manager based dev team that works on the actual product. And then, and then we'll go through a big project that's more platform based. So, we talked about platform engineering. Now we're, now we're scoped down to a dev team to just make it a little smaller. So, when you talk about tech debt, this is what your senior leaders hear. <laughs> because engineering time is expensive. Yeah, your, our, our salaries are nice, we get paid well, we have equity, but that's not even what I mean. Engineering time is so much more expensive than even just that straight cost because it's opportunity cost, right? Your company hired you for a reason. They hired you to stay ahead of that other company, to build that feature that allow us to land these customers over here, right? Anytime you're not working on that type of work, it's costing the company money, lots of money in opportunity cost. Or they overhired, but like, how often does that happen? <laughs> they tend to fix that. Um, <laughs> so your time is super valuable. So if you're like, I wanna work on this project over there, by default they're gonna be like, no, absolutely not, unless they're just trying to humor you. And they can't do very much of that and like make the best books balance. So why do you want to address this thing that you're calling tech debt, right? What do you mean by tech debt? You actually want to address specific tech debt because it has an impact on you, on the team, on the product, on the company. And those impacts are things people across the whole company care about, right? Um, they want to know that you're not just polishing your trophy in the corner and like, or playing with the newest features of Clojure, right? Like, if you've got the right tech debt, it has impact. It has real business impact that you can prioritize along all the other business projects, right? So it's a, it's a project, so a project needs a business case because that's how projects get prioritized. This is basically the lightest weight thing that a product manager is gonna do to get a project prioritized and pitched, right? And there's a lot of words on here. I don't expect you to read them all. But one thing I wanna call out is you're defining what the problem is. Who does it impact? And most importantly, what are the outcomes? 
Why the, how do we know if this succeeded? Why the heck are we doing this project? And this is work that in most companies, not, not all, I know some of you are sitting here being like, my company is not this structured. But most companies, right, you're doing some type of justification for why a project is getting on the roadmap, right? You have to show what that impact will be. And it really comes down to metrics. And this is where we all have a superpower because most people in this room are engineers, right? Which means we have access to so much data, especially if we've instrumented our systems well, right? We have got all sorts of granular data. We can slice and dice, and if the data's not there, we can add it in, add in the data streams, right? We can see exactly what the impact of our work might be and make sure we have those data streams um, in a way that maybe your product managers, um, your salespeople, right? They may not have the ability to instrument their data, their system well enough to like get really detailed metrics. So this is your superpower. Um, so let's go through a quick example because I've been doing a lot of talking in the abstract and it's nice to get a little more concrete sometimes. So let's say you're on call and your pager goes off um, and one of your databases is just eating CPU and it's not, you know, on fire yet, but if you leave it for another couple months, it's gonna be, prod's probably gonna go down. So you don't, you don't love this, right? So you click on a few of those you, you click on the graph, you go into a few traces, you see it's the high latency stuff, you go look at your latency, you grab a bit, you see what's different, you call CS to go look at this customer because they're a pain in the butt, there's something weird going on there. But um, really what you dig into is you're like, oh, my deletes, my deletes are slow and that's what's eating up my CPU. And I saw an article last week, it looks like if we upgrade the widget library, it's gonna fix the latency, the deletes are gonna be much faster. So we need to upgrade this widget library. But um, that's like a two, three week project and my team's in the middle of something and how do I get this prioritized? How do I get the product manager, the rest of the company to think that this is a problem? Because how do I even describe the problem? Like when I go to my PM, how do I explain it? Do I say, the CPU's too high? They're gonna be like, so? Buy more CPU? Like, why do we care, <laughs> right? Are you gonna say we're getting paged? Like, they might care about that because engineering time is expensive and no one wants you to get burnt out, but they're probably gonna be like, adjust your alerting? Like, why, again, why do we care? But if you say, we've got two weeks or we've got two months until we run out of capacity on this product and we can't sell anymore, right? There's a hard cutoff unless we do this project in two months and we just can't sell any more foo after that. You've got everyone's attention. <laughs> like everyone, everyone is like, yes, do that project, do it now. What do you need to drop? Like, how can we make sure this is a success? So how you talk about a problem makes a huge difference. Um, and then the project, right? Like you need to name the project, right? You could name it Upgrade the Widget Library and everyone's gonna be re like, huh, what, why? Uh, what's that team doing? Uh, or you could be like, we need to reduce the CPU on the database and they'll be like, uh, I guess, was there something, there was something about a high CPU, I kind of recall that, no. Talk about what the impact's gonna be, right? Talk about why the business cares. So if you're like, we're gonna gain 10x capacity for foo, everyone cares. Everyone's like, yes, yes, that project. How far are you? Are you up to 2x? Are you up to 3x? Like, how's it going? Um, it's a little scary as an engineer to make a promise like that, right? Because what if updating the widget library only gives you like a 4x increase, right? But if 10x is what you need and you sold the project on that, then you've just bought yourself justification to work on another tech debt project to help increase the capacity for foo, right? So if you really sell the outcome, you're, you're setting yourself up for success. Yeah, there's more accountability, for sure, but you're also setting yourself up to really address the underlying problem you need. And the thing to remember is every single thing on your roadmap is a bet, right? All those product-led projects, they're bets. They've interviewed customers, they might even have customers with money on the line, but are they actually gonna sign? 
is the project actually going to do what that customer needs? They are all bets. Everything on the roadmap is a bet. So you don't have to be 1,000% sure. You can be like 80% sure. You can be like, we think this is the best thing. That's OK. Um, but that's so much work. Why, why, why can't they just listen? Why can't you just say, we need to do this for the health of the system, and everyone say, yeah, go ahead? Sometimes, sometimes you can get away with that if it's a little thing and the team's not underwater. But really, this, this is what your product process looks like, right? Like, all those little sheep are projects. And that little tiny gate is your team working on stuff, right? And they, they can't all fit through at once. They just can't. And by the time you get your product roadmap, there's been so much negotiation. People have been playing by a feature. People have been interviewing customers. People have been pitching stuff. People have been looking at alignment with the company's strategic goals and the key metrics across the whole company, right? Like, for a project to get at the top of your roadmap, it's been through a cage match, right? So what you're basically saying is, I should just be able to cut but no, no, these are important projects, right? These are key to the company's survival, or they would not have a whole team staffed up to be doing this stuff, right? So really, it's just polite to put together a business case. It's treating your coworkers with the same respect, right, that they're treating you with. You don't want them to come and say, do this, and be like, well, why? Because sales said so. Like, no. No, that's not how you want to work, right? You want to know why, and what's the impact, and what's the justification, and what's the downstream results. So give other people the same respect, right? Um, and then a final note on getting something on the roadmap is that when you try and get things on the roadmap matter, right? Sometimes it might come out of a page, and it's emergent, and you've just got to disrupt stuff. But I don't know about you, I like it when my roadmap doesn't constantly change. Like, it's nice to have some predictability. And that's even more true on the go-to-market side, right? Your marketing team has to plan way ahead. They're going to be picking conferences. They're going to be coming up with talks for those conferences to queue up features, right? Like, there's a whole machinery across the whole company. Sales is maybe promised stuff. Disrupting the roadmap is expensive. So if you know what the planning process is in your company, and you can get your project into that herd of sheep <laughs> to be prioritized, right? At the t same time, the other, all the other sheep are showing up. Uh, you have a much better chance of getting on the roadmap because if you're trying to budge in late, like it's a higher bar. Cool. Anyone lost? No. Cool. So I'm gonna go. I told you we were gonna have the team level example. And then the like all of engineering level example. So this is the fun all of engineering. Like how do you change roadmaps across engineering? How do you do big systematic change? Um, and this is actually a case study example. So familiar story, young company, growing fast, the back end starting to creak but people aren't used to it because, you know, it was built really nicely to start with, and everyone's like, yeah, backend can handle it. Backend can't handle it anymore. Mm -mm. Things actually need to happen to, make it, to enable the scaling. Um, roadmap's busy. There's customer traction. Everyone's really excited. Big land grab. So if we ignore this, I think you all know what's going to happen. Um, the pagers sing. Prod goes down. It's bad times, right? Sales is angry because all of a sudden engineering is the bottleneck for scaling across the whole company and like you don't ever want to be in that situation. It's just, it's a bad place. So we need a plan. We need a plan to get ahead of that. So where do we start? We start with the metrics the business cares the most about. So in most startups these days, that's going to be ARR, which is annual recurring revenue. And for any subscription company, that's how much money comes in each year. So customer buys your thing, they pay you each month or each year, and so it's a subscription, and the more, the more customers that are signed up, the more money you have, the more users. So your ARR and your user base are gonna like be correlated, but kind of in a loose way, because like 
bigger customers might get volume discounts or maybe they'll have enterprise features and they'll actually pay more per unit, right? But it's a place to start. Your company predicts ARR, they give it to the board, they give it to investors in terms of investment in fundraising cycles, right? ARR is a super key metric that your chief operating officer, your finance team, your exec staff talks about. They know what the ARR is gonna be. So the first thing we did for this project is we went to the COO and we're like, cool, what are the ARR projections? What do we need to be able to handle? What, what's the growth we're planning for this company? Um, and once we got those numbers, went and we're like, cool, what's the breakdown across types of customers that we have currently? Um, and let's actually break it down by customer. Like, are there outlier customers? Do we have canonical customers? How are they using the product, right? And so having this ability to kind of slice and dice your data lets you have a really good model when you say, it's gonna increase. It's like, well, how, right? Like, are we gonna get more like that weird customer that like uses 10 times as much as this one thing than anyone else? Or is it gonna be like kind of these standard run of the mill customers, right? Or is it gonna be like the free tier customers? Or like, you know, you can get a little more detailed, right? And a little bit more into exactly what types of systems need to scale at what amount. So you can take all this data back, you can talk to product and be like, cool, so let's talk about each of the features we sell, how much more do we need? Do we need 2x, do we need 3x, do we need 10x, right? Like for each of our features, how do we expect this to scale? What's our assumption on customer mix? What's our assumption on customer persona, right? And your product person can figure out a lot of this. Again, I told you this is whole company level, most of you are looking concerned. You, you don't have to do this on an individual team, but this is what it can look like, like big, right? And then I'm sure you can scale it down. I believe in you. Um, <laughs> so once you, have, once you have this model, right, all of a sudden you have buy-in across the company on how much each of these systems need to scale, right? These user-facing systems. So what we did is we went to each of our back-end systems. Our back-end systems are named after dogs and went, worked with the teams who run them and are like, cool, so given that this front end system, like customer facing feature needs to scale by this much, what's that gonna mean for load on your system? What's gonna break, right? What projects do you know you need to do to keep this from breaking? Which projects maybe do you need to do? What things are already breaking? And so we went around to each of the teams in engineering and talked to them about each of the services and and just did a little reflection, right? In the next year, in the next two years, what do you know you need to do? And obviously this isn't gonna be everything. I'm not trying to make it everything. In fact, if you have something where you can be like, I'm gonna be aggressive and try and get everything, or you're gonna be a little cautious and be like, well, we might miss a few, but we know these are real, go with the ones you know you're real, because that's gonna build trust for you in the company, right? Um, so then you take this, and we made a roadmap, a scaling roadmap. Uh, these are not the actual project names, um, but I thought that they were fun. Um, <laughs> so we are like, these are the things that are already breaking, right? These are the things that like, we're pretty sure are gonna break. Like, you really need to do these things. Uh, and these are like, well, if we did these, it'd get you more, road, get you more runway on the others, but like, we could probably get away without doing them, right? Like, these are more specific projects versus problems. And, you know, what's done, because it's fun to be able to be like, hey, we did all these things, look at this, that's so cool, like we're actually making progress, tech debt work is happening, scaling work is happening. Um, and so we took this roadmap before products had finalized their roadmap for the year, uh, and we merged them, right? Each team understood these projects, they briefed their product manager, Product manager went in ready to advocate, right? Because they know if these projects don't happen, the roadmap's just gonna get blown up. Their customers are gonna be angry, marketing's gonna be angry at them, sales is gonna be angry at them. No one likes the roadmap being disrupted, right? So this is the way to get ahead of it, to get like, ah, so people know, and you can plan. I really prefer to work on projects ahead of time than when prod is down. It's just, it's a more fun, it's more fun. <laughs> so got them on the roadmap. Um, and then the last step is you have to celebrate the heck out of stuff, right? 
Celebrate when you finish a project and see that metrics change. And all of a sudden, you're like, yeah, we have 10 more, 10x more foo. Go sell foo. Go, go. There's plenty. Or you can even, adver you can even celebrate um, that server, the one we told you was going to break if we didn't do this project. It's starting to break. But guess what? The project of fixed sits in, in flight. We, we are ahead of it. We're not being completely reactive. So we need to finish this project, but we saw this coming. We're ahead of it. We can plan, right? So, oops. And if you celebrate that, celebrating is important because, again, the things that are customer facing, they automatically kind of have celebrations, right? Sales is excited. Deals get closed. Money comes in. Party, 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 right? But this work is really important too. But you have, to, you have to explain why it's important. And you have to continuously explain why it's important. Um, and talk about how you're kind of ahead of things and why this happens. And that builds you, builds you the credibility to continue to get things on the roadmap and continue to get ahead. Um, so I gave you this case study. We actually did it, like not that particular roadmap items. There was nothing about like dog collar colors. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so far this year, quarter of the projects are in progress, another quarter are scheduled, some are done, half of engineering is involved, no pushback from product, it's been in the OKRs. This works. People know that there's a certain amount of scaling work, there's a certain amount of system architecture work that needs to happen, and people across the company mostly want that balance to work out, right? But you have to make it easy. <laughs> you have to explain why. You have to give nice concrete projects and talk about the outcomes. Um, and yeah, not bad for the end of Q1, right? <laughs> um, so I just did a lot of talking. Well, what were the key points again? Uh, at a high level, if you take away nothing else, you work in a business. And at the end of the day, we're here to serve customers, right? And the business as a whole. So you need to put things in terms of business cases. You need to be able to tell the story in a way that the whole company can understand. And the most direct way you can do that, the way that's going to speak the loudest, is if you tie it to metrics. If you have enough visibility into your system to be able to use that data to drive conclusions, to show the change. So that's how you can make organizational change. And I talked a lot about scaling here. But really, you can apply this to almost any type of technical organizational change. If you can think about it, tech debt, right? It could be your monolith. It can be where everyone has to like work in the same code base. It could be your CI CD pipeline that's slowing people down, right? It could be your tests that are old and crufty, right? Like there's all sorts of different things you can make business cases for. And you can use the same thing, right? Maybe you can't tie it to ARR. Maybe you're going to tie it to how fast that team can move and how many more projects you think they can get done in the rest of the year. Like look at their roadmap and be like, if we do this, we can still get the same number of projects done because it's going to speed it up, right? Talk about the return on investment for everything. And it's scary because it's getting accountability, but they're paying us. We're asking them to bet on something. We need to tell them what the bet's going to pay off for if everything works out, right? It's, it's only fair. It's only fair. Uh, so, any questions? <laughs>